Welcome to Working for Women, the independent women's forum podcast, where we are changing the conversation about women and public policy for the better. Hello, I'm Charlotte Hayes, Director of Cultural Programs at the Independent Women's Forum. I'm really excited to be talking today to Diana Furtscott Roth. Uh, Diana has a new book coming out, Disinherited, How Washington is Betraying America's Young. Uh, None other than Elaine Chow, who's the former Secretary of Labor, says, this is the book you absolutely need to read if you are a millennial or care about one. Um, Before we begin, I just have to brag a little bit. Diana was one of the authors uh, of of the Independent Women's Forum, Lean Together, An Agenda for Smarter Government, Stronger Communities, and More Opportunity for Women. She needs no introduction to the IWF uh, reader and our, our, our people who come to our blog because she's she's a prolific writer. Uh, she is a former uh, U.S. Department of Labor economist. Uh, she's director of Economics 21 and a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. So, Diana, to, to just begin, uh, the, the book is called Disinherited, How Washington is Betraying America's Young. So how is Washington betraying America's young? Washington is passing on all the costs of its programs to young people and at the same time making it difficult for them to work and making it difficult for them to get a good education. Young people are graduating with an average of $27,000 in college debt uh, and then it's hard for them to get into the workforce because occupational licensing rules, higher minimum wage rules, bans on unpaid internships, we're doing everything we can to prevent young people from working, yet we're expecting them to pay our debts, to pay off the $18 trillion in national debt. I want to read a, uh, a blurb from Kevin Williamson, who's read your book and, and is urging others to do so. And Kevin says, the millennials are in their own way toward becoming the first generation to achieve a lower standard of living than their parents. And that's not happening by ha- accident. It is instead a matter of making choices, a matter of poor policy choices and opportunities missed. Diana, who who are the people making these choices? Well, basically, politicians are just passing things on from one Congress to another without tackling our problems in a definitive manner. So young people know that they're paying this thing called FICA out of their paychecks. And that's Social Security and Medicare, but the programs aren't going to be there when they retire. So it's not fair that we're asking them to pay for currently retired people when the program won't be there. But Congress isn't doing anything to fix the problem right now. It could raise the retirement age for older people. Uh, It could increase the contribution slightly. It could do something to fix this program that everyone knows is out of balance. So that's just one example of how politicians are just passing this on kicking the can down the road. Diana, I, I want to ask you about Social Security. I'm always joking with my colleagues at IWF that I'm really glad they're going to take care of me by paying exorbitant Social Security. Is there any way to save Social Security for people who've been paying into it for a lifetime and yet not steal from millennials? I think we just need to make a few small tweaks in it. For example, people under 50 or under 55, their retirement age could be raised very gradually. And then we could move to a different way of indexing the benefits. Right now, the benefits increase with wages in the economy. As the wage level goes up, benefits go up. We could index it instead to the price level. So as price level goes up, then our benefits go up. And prices actually go up somewhat less than wages. So these two small changes would bring Social Security into balance. But Congress isn't even doing that. Diana, getting an education has always been considered the way to get ahead in the United States. Um, Do millennials have a harder time than previous generations getting an education? And why? What are the policies that, as you put it, mire our educational system in mediocrity? One thing with elementary and secondary school education is that we are increasingly keeping on poorly performing teachers. Again, it's an example of favoring old rather than young. Studies show that if a child has a better teacher, this results in greater lifetime earnings. In fact, if an average classroom has a better teacher, 
that results in an extra $250,000 over the lifetime earnings of that classroom full of children. Good heavens. Yeah, but yet increasingly schools don't want to fire the unqualified teachers. In fact, in New York, there's even such a thing as a rubber room where they keep them on, uh, paying them, but without allowing these unqualified people to do any teaching. So we need to be a lot more proactive about saying that if someone's not qualified to teach, they don't have their job. We need to get rid of this tenure for elementary and secondary education teachers. Well, now let me ask you something else. You mentioned college uh, loan. In my era, most people got out of college without debt, and it was still pretty darn hard to get started in life. I can't imagine how frightening it is to graduate with tens of thousand dollars, thousands worth of debt. How the heck did this happen, and what can we do about it? Well, college has been getting gradually more and more expensive, and it's been correlated with the increase in federal aid. So colleges see that the federal government is going to subsidize more student loans and allow students to borrow more. So they just take the money and raise tuition. And they're not hiring more professors. They're hiring more administrators, more people like themselves. 70% of students now graduate with debt, and the average debt is $27,000. Wow. Many students, about half of students, have even more than $27,000. And guidance counselors, I think, could do a better job of steering students into less expensive college education, community colleges, for example, that cost on average $3,000 a year that provide immediate job opportunities when kids graduate if they choose one of the high return professions, such as one of the health service professions or computer programming. Or you can take that two years a community college and transfer to a four-year college and then you have a four-year college education at practically half the price. There's a lot more we could be doing to teach students about what pays off and what doesn't because the worst is graduating with all those thousands of dollars in debt and then not having a job afterwards. Senator Mario Rubio, in his recent book, his recent book called American Dream said that when he was sworn in as a U.S. senator, he still had $100,000 in debt from going to college and law school. You know, at a quick glance, hiking the minimum wage is something that it sounds, sounds like it would be beneficial to millennials. Uh, they have entry-level jobs if they're lucky enough to have a job. Uh, and, and they would be, be the people that you could argue would be really affected by hiking the minimum wage. So why is it that hiking the minimum wage is not a good thing for them? Well, 97% of Americans earn above minimum wage, not out of the kindness of their employers, but because that's what employers have to pay to retain them. But uh, hiking the minimum wage makes it difficult for teens and unskilled people to get their first job in the workforce. So if you're 16, 17, 18, you want a summer job, raising the wage to $15 an hour is going to mean that you're not going to get hired. Even at $7.25 an hour, the teen unemployment rate is 17%, and the African-American teen unemployment rate is 35%. There are always going to be people displaced the higher the minimum wage is. And people understand this. When I say if raising the minimum wage doesn't have any effect, let's make it the average wage in the economy, $25 an hour. Everyone understands, well, no, some people are going to lose their jobs. They just don't realize that there are some young people who are also going to lose their jobs if it goes up to 10 or $15 an hour. It's just a different group of people who they don't know. Well, it also seems to me, Diana, that, that young people don't just use, lose their income. They lose the ability to, to, to gain skills. You, you, you can't just be uh, an executive right off the bat. You need those, minim those entry-level jobs. You really do. And if there's a higher minimum wage, then what happens is you have to have more education in order to qualify for that particular job. But if you don't have that education, if you're one of these high school dropouts, if you're one of the 45% of young people in an urban area who hasn't graduated from high school, you still need a job. So it's great that those entry-level jobs are available. It's really immoral to say that if you have skills under $10 or $15 an hour, you're not going to be allowed to work in the United States of America. It's positively un-American because America has always been the place where people could go to get a job.
I take it that you do not believe in uh, abolishing unpaid internships, that they're exploitation. I really think that unpaid internships should stay, and it's really interesting that the Labor Department allows unpaid internships at the White House, uh, in the government, at non-profits such as ACORN or Fight for 15 or New York Communities for Change, or even IWF or the Manhattan Institute, but not places like Warner Brothers Records or Goldman Sachs. We have stories in our book, multiple stories of young people, and one of the most heart-rending is Sammy Page, a music major who wants to have his own band, who was offered an unpaid internship at Warner Brothers Records last summer. He wasn't able to take the internship because the record company required course credit for it in order to protect themselves from lawsuits. And so he had to just spend his summer on his own playing his violin and guitar on the street and recording on his own, on his own computer. That's the kind of thing uh, that hurts young people rather than helps them. There were interns at The New Yorker who sued Condé Nast, the owner of The New Yorker, saying that they were exploited. And after this, it really opened the floodgates to more litigation and more private companies, for-profit companies said, if kids don't get college credit, we're not going to uh, hire them as interns. It looks like policy makers would, would realize what a, what a mistake it is to, uh, to, 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 to force people to pay for interns or set up policies that encourage this. I mean, why doesn't somebody say, this is ridiculous? Well, that's one reason I wrote the book. I'm saying this is ridiculous, and I think more people should be saying so, too. It's even worse than that. This young man, Sammy Page, he was told by Warner Brothers that he could enroll in community college. The community college would give him credit for the internship. So, in essence, he would have to pay to have his unpaid internship. It makes no sense at all. Just curious, Diana, and I hadn't been planned to ask this. What do you think about President Obama's plan for two years of free community college? Community college isn't that expensive right now, and there is financial aid, so I think that that's not a good idea. Uh, it's really important for people to value the education that they have. And if people know it's free, the demand is going to increase, and people won't be as careful of choosing the courses that they're going to take. Community college is already tremendous value. There is financial aid available for people who need it, and it doesn't make any sense to just make it free. Diana, we talked a little bit about licensing, but explain that a little bit more. How does licensing for professions uh, keep millennials out of the job market? Well, imagine that you graduated from college and you have a degree in art history or comparative literature, and what you want to do is start an interior design company. Well, you might think that's simple, but in many states, you have to have a license. You have to have two years training to start your own interior design company. You can't just go and advise people. And it's like that with more and more professions. We give examples in the book of people who wanted to braid hair, who had to have multiple uh, years training to do that, of a young man who wanted to start his own pest control service, and he wasn't able to do that, of someone who wanted to open a business as a computer technician. And guess what? In Texas, you have to have a license, a detective license, to be a computer <laughs> technician. Goodness. Yeah. So these are all barriers that stop young people from opening their own companies and starting their own businesses. And the rate of startups has actually fallen over the past five or ten years. We need to make that change. Because if you can't get a regular job with a company, you ought to be able to, you ought to be free to start your own business if it doesn't harm anyone. Now we all know that doctors and dentists need licenses because they could harm somebody if they weren't properly qualified. But no one ever died from a mismatched couch and rug. <laughs> Um, Diana, do, do policy knowers, uh, do policymakers know that they are betraying young people and just not care? Or do they not know it? I think that they don't know it. I think that they're making the easy decisions. It's very difficult for them to, say, fix some of the debt and deficit problems we have. It's very difficult for them to give in to the American Association of Retired Persons. It's very easy for them to vote that young people's health insurance premiums should be higher. But there isn't any organized effort on the part of young people to show the problems that they're in. 
there's no American Association of Young Persons. That's what we need. We need someone to be showing politicians that these problems affect young people, and so they're going to be affecting all of us in a few years, all of us later on, if they're not fixed. So far, Diana, you, we've painted a pretty bleak picture in this conversation. Uh, is there any hope? Can the disinherited generation be reclaimed, or is it just a lost generation? Well, we have a program that involves rolling back some of these regulations that directly affect young people's ability to get into the labor market, of trying to adjust some of these programs such as Social Security and Medicare so that they'll be there for young people when they retire, uh, and of trying to trim back on entitlements so that the debt and the deficit uh, are not so high and it's not such a big tax bill for young people to pay when they finally have jobs of their own. And we think Congress might want to look at some of our ideas and think about it through the lens of their children and grandchildren. Diana, I know it's going to be a great book, and I hope Congress will look at it. I hope it will become uh, a book that all millennials read and uh, learn how to cope with, uh, well, actually learn how to change policy so they won't have to have to go into, into, into hot for my generation. Uh, congratulations to you and your co-author, Jared Mayer. And uh, I look forward to reading this. Thank you so much, Diana. Well, thanks so much to you, Charlotte. And I really look forward to your conference. Oh, we're looking forward to having you at our summit. We were so excited when you agreed to participate because uh, I think you know more about uh, the more about economics than just about anybody. Well, thank you so much. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast please give it a thumbs up, share it on social media, or stop by iwf.org for similar content.